If sexual shame were a hurricane, I have spent most of my professional life in the eye of the storm. I was Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney for 14 years and prosecuted sex crimes for the majority of my career. And I saw a lot, friends. I saw a teenage boy who'd been abused by a well-loved religious figure in his community, but who kept quiet because he didn't want people to think he was gay. I saw a paralegal who was kidnapped from her home and brutally raped. And when it came time to testify at trial, she was terrified, but not just because she'd be in the same courtroom as her attacker. She was scared of running into a colleague at the courthouse and having to explain what she was doing there. I saw a young girl who was impregnated by her biological dad and the immense anguish she felt after delivering a stillborn baby. Guilt is, I did something bad. Shame is, I am bad. I'm broken, I'm not normal, there's something wrong with me. Shame is a painful belief that we're flawed and because of that flaw, we're not worthy of love or belonging. And as humans, we are hardwired to feel shame, which is pretty terrible, right? And why would our brains do that to us? Why would our brains be designed to experience an emotion, a feeling that is so, so unpleasant? Well, because a really long time ago, we needed shame to stay alive. When we existed as hunters and gatherers, we depended on our closely knit communities for our survival. And when there was a threat of that community devaluing us, this unpleasant feeling that we now call shame would creep in to keep us in check. We, we weren't designed to ruffle feathers. We as humans, we were designed to fit in. But the problem is we're not hunters and gatherers anymore. And, and shame is now considered to be a psychologically damaging emotion. It's bad for us, but we're still wired to feel it. So if we think of our brains like computers, when we're talking about shame, we're all essentially walking around with these outdated, clunky desktops on our necks that also have viruses on them. And today, I'm gonna to talk about one type of virus, a specific kind of shame, and that's sexual shame. When I say sexual shame, you, you might think of the cases, the stories that I mentioned earlier, because those are the stories that are ripped from the headlines. Those are the stories that we binge watch on TV. And the problem is they perpetuate this idea that there's this boogeyman out there. And if we're lucky enough to escape him, then sex and intimacy just won't be issues for us. But the truth is, sexual shame, it lives inside. It lives quietly in the shadows, in bedrooms all around the world. Sexual shame is this idea that there's something wrong with us because of who we are as sexual beings, who we're attracted to, what our desires are, how our bodies work. Again, it's this feeling, you know, I'm broken. I'm not normal. There's something wrong with me. And yes, that feeling can come from surviving trauma, but it can also come from the messages we get from our family, the messages we get from our religion, the social cues that we soak up every single day that we enter out into the world. Researcher Emily Nagoski has gone so far as to say that we are raising women to be sexually dysfunctional. I'm a survivor of both childhood and teenage sexual trauma, but that wasn't why I felt broken. My shame came from feeling like there was something wrong with me because I didn't want what I thought everyone else wanted. On paper, I had a really good life. I, I had a great career as a prosecutor. I had a successful husband. We lived in a really cute 
craftsman bungalow in a charming suburb of LA, and some people dream of that. They dream of that white picket fence. But to me, it felt like the walls of a prison. And as I was trying to convince juries of the truth beyond a reasonable doubt in my professional life, whew, I was living a huge lie in my personal life because the truth was I didn't want conventional monogamy. I didn't want kids. I didn't want a life of just going to couples game nights. I wanted to know what it might be like to go to a sex party. I wanted to know what it might be like to design my own kind of relationship, the kind that doesn't actually fit neatly in a box. But admitting that to the people around me, admitting that to myself, that felt really, really hard. That felt impossible. So instead, I found a therapist and I begged her to fix me. I would go in week after week sobbing and plead with her, please, just help me feel normal and happy and grateful for this really good life that I have. And week after week, she called me on my crap in the nicest way a therapist can call you on your crap. <laughs> and, and she did her best to convince me that there was nothing to be fixed. I wasn't broken, I was just different. And that I was allowed to be different. This all came to a head during one of our sessions. She said these words to me, words that I will never forget. She said, Rena, there's a scream buried deep inside of you, and it's dying to get out. Those words ended up being the key to unlock that prison cell, the key to give me my freedom, the key to give me permission to end my marriage. And so I did. And the next few years ended up being the most transformative period of my personal life. I, I started scratching things off my bucket list, including a few sex parties. I, I partnered with somebody who, who loves coloring outside the line just as much as I do. Yes, I had dropped a huge bomb in my life, friends, but I like to say I was building my dream home from the ashes. And then something kind of magical happened. Once I felt like I had permission to speak up for what I wanted when it came to sex and intimacy and relationships, the things I was most ashamed of, I felt like I had permission to speak up for what I wanted in every area of my life. I had permission to be me. And I realized then that I wanted to help other women give themselves permission too. So I went and I dropped another bomb in my life. I traded in my business suit for pink hair and ended my lengthy career as a prosecutor to become a women's intimacy coach and educator. But even in this new line of work, I once again found myself in the eye of that hurricane. Research by the National Institute of Health tells us that 43% of women suffer from what's known as female sexual dysfunction, which is defined as either difficulty reaching orgasm or decreased sexual desire. 43%. That means nearly half of the women on this earth meet the criteria for something that's literally called dysfunction. And if we remember that, that shame is, I'm broken, I'm not normal, there's something wrong with me, I am dysfunctional, we are talking about one heck of a lot of shame as our baseline. And having worked with educated, coached, thousands of women now, I can tell you this, that 43% number isn't the ceiling when we're talking about sexual shame, it's the floor. Because there are plenty of women out there who can reach orgasm just fine, who have healthy sex drives, but who still feel like there's something wrong with them. That number doesn't account for the woman who thinks she's going to hell for having sex before marriage 
or the woman who will only take her clothes off when the lights are off. That number doesn't account for the woman who feels dirty every time she touches herself or the woman who has one night stands and then hates herself for it the next morning. And once we account for all of those women, we're looking at a number far, far higher than 43%. We are looking at a sexual shame epidemic. So what do we do about it? What's, what's the cure for this virus? According to Brene Brown, who, if you're not familiar with her, is kind of considered to be the world's expert on shame. The only way to resolve shame is to talk about it. I saw that in my own life, but I've also seen it in the lives of the women I've had the honor of working with directly as clients. They've spanned the globe and the wide sexuality spectrum. Cisgender women and trans women from their early 20s through their 60s. And I've seen a lot. I have seen survivors of sexual trauma truly, truly enjoy intimacy for the first time in their lives. I've seen religious housewives getting kinky with their husbands after 15 years of not even being able to have a conversation about sex. I have seen successful cosmopolitan go-getters let down their guard and show up as themselves, show up vulnerably in the dating world. And how do they do this? By communicating, by talking about it, by being honest with themselves and then with their partner, by suggesting role play so they could feel empowered in their body, by sending a text to their wife with, hey, you know what might be fun to try? By being the one to say, I love you first. And then something magical happened for a lot of them too. They stood up for themselves at work. Some even quit their jobs entirely. They, they got on airplanes and traveled solo for the first time. They got the tattoo they'd always wanted but were scared of being judged for. They started living. Because once they became shameless, when it came to the most hidden part of who they were, it spilled into everything. Their path to empowerment started in the bedroom, but it didn't end there. So how do you start your journey? Again, by communicating, by talking about it. I will quote sex advice columnist Dan Savage here and say simply, use your words. For starters, stop faking orgasms. Research done by Dr. Lori Mintz tells us that the overwhelming majority of us, meaning people with vulvas, we cannot orgasm just through <laughs> penetration, just through intercourse. We need external clitoral stimulation. But seven out of 10 of us have faked orgasms, which means that we're basically training our lovers to do exactly what doesn't work for us. And we're missing out on pleasure all because we're too scared to say out loud, hey, my body just can't climax in a way that it's not actually designed to. But also be honest about what you need above the neck. Be honest about your sexual fantasies. As psychotherapist Esther Perel says, our fantasies reveal our deepest emotional needs. Justin Lay Miller of the Kinsey Institute has actually done a ton of research on this, on what we think about sexually. And what his research tells us is that only half of you in this room are brave enough to tell your partner what your fantasies are. Because of shame, because of fear over what the response is gonna be that you're gonna get. And why is this a problem? Because his research also tells us that couples who enact their fantasies show the highest rates of relationship satisfaction. So again, you might have shame and fear holding you back, not just from more pleasure, but more connection with the people you love. And pushing through that fear can look as simple as, hey, you know what might be fun to try? 
Sex is one of life's greatest joys that's absolutely free. It's, it's a way we express ourselves, like singing or dancing. It's one of the few ways we get to play as adults, to use our imagination. It's a way we connect. And shame? Shame has no place in all that joy. So if there's a scream buried deep inside of you that's dying to get out, listen to it. Because that's the real you in there. And start letting it out one word at a time. And those clunky, outdated desktops we're all walking around with, yes, they are wired for shame. But ultimately, they're wired for connection. They're wired for community. So find yours. They're out there. We are out here. And we are ready to help you weather that storm. Thank you. This has been an honor.